excuse me. So last week, we had a wonderful celebration, did we not? It was a blessed, beautiful, wonderful celebration. And as we celebrated the new movement that God is doing and that he is allowing us to be a part of, we had looked at some very important pieces about us here in the church, our call and our purpose. And I want to just remind you, because this is so important and we should be thinking about this often and speaking of this often, our call it comes from Matthew chapter 22, to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That is the call that God is laying on each one of us, saying, this is what I want you to do. Here is the number one call for your whole life. Everything you do, everything you are, this is it. To love God with literally all that we are, all that we have, and to love our neighbor. And then he says our purpose, which we can see in Matthew 28 for this, our purpose, what we should be doing then as a church, but as individuals as well, but especially as a church where there's more strength, where there's more power, is to be making disciples for Jesus Christ. Making disciples for Jesus Christ. Now, we've, we've heard these statements a lot in the church. I know I've spoke them a lot. You probably know these scriptures well. You know the commands. You've heard it often. It sounds simple, right? You can remember this, can't you? I hope so, right? To love God with all that you are and to love your neighbor and to make disciples. That's about it, right? Love God with all that you are, love your neighbors, and make disciples. We can remember that. That's a simple statement. But how do we actually fulfill them? We may be able to remember them. We may know them well. We may have heard them a hundred times. But how do we actually fulfill them? Like, how do we actually love God with literally everything that we are, with everything that we have? every single piece of us. How do we literally do that? How do we accomplish just that part then, let alone love others like that in such a great way when we all know that some people are pretty difficult to love, right? And that gets difficult. We don't always perfect ourselves. People around us aren't perfect. It gets difficult to love. How do we do all of that? How do we then have the, the courage and the confidence needed to really go out into the world and make disciples for Jesus Christ? Like, how do we do that when we know the world doesn't necessarily seem to care right now? Like, they don't always seem like they want to hear it, right? I mean, we know they're hungry. They're hungry for something. But it's not until the right time that their hearts and their eyes and their ears open up that they're going to really hear that. So how do we do all of that? And these statements, again, are easy enough to remember and to know, but what I'd like to do today is to dive deeper into how we actually um, abide or how we actually fall into this call and fulfill it as well as the purpose. And I think John, the book of John, does a really good job of giving us some wonderful examples of how to do this. And we're going to talk a lot, I kind of left the secret out there, but we're going to talk a lot about abiding. And really, that is a huge theme over John's entire book. His number one theme is to show who Jesus is, to show his, his deity. But within all of that, he tells us over and over again how to fulfill these call, this call and this purpose. So let's look here at John 15. I share this one with you because I know we, we did this a few months back, maybe I think it was early in the year. Um, we took four weeks just to preach on this one piece of scripture. Um, but this really is sort of the base of where we're going today. So I'd like to just back up here and, and talk about this. But it says, I am the true grapevine. This is Jesus' words. So Jesus is saying, I am the true grapevine. That true word there means a lot. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You've already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So do this, right? This is the next step. This is what Jesus is saying. Like, I've already done this. You've already been pruned. You've already been purified. So remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. So those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless, like useless branches, excuse me, like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. 
And John here is using a word pretty quickly in verse 5 here, <coughs> excuse me, that is actually the Greek word it says meno. And meno literally is translated into English as abide or remain or stay or even wait. <laughs> like sometimes we have to wait on Jesus, right? That We know that's true. So Jesus is telling his listeners here, I am the only way, I'm it. I am the only way that you will receive what you need to be fruitful. I'm the only way this is going to happen. I'm the only way you're going to be fruitful in your call or in your purpose. So you must remain in me, stay in me, abide in me. And there is a key truth and theme in all of these verses throughout the book of John. And here's your first point for the day. If you'd like to write these down on the back of your bulletin, there's a section right there. These are things that hopefully will take our mind back to the Lord's message as we read them throughout the week. But the first one is this, if we abide in Christ, right? There's that key word, if. If we abide in Christ, we will be fruitful in our call and our purpose. God knows that the only way any of this is possible, the only way that we could fulfill our call and purpose is if we remain connected to him, is if we remain abiding in him. And that makes sense, right? We get this from this wonderful example that Jesus gave us about the vine and the branches. We know that in order for a branch to actually produce fruit, it has to remain on the vine. You can't break a branch off and then expect you're going to get an apple on it later, right? That doesn't work like that. It's not getting nourished. It's not getting fed. It has absolutely no power. It has no life if it's broken off from the vine. So Jesus gives this clear instruction of how to remain in him or to abide in him because he has these big plans for those who put their faith, who put their hope, who put their trust in him, plans for them to literally change the world, change the world. And he knows that we can't do it without him. If we want to be more effective in fulfilling our purpose and fulfilling our call as the church, let me just say it this way. If we want to be more effective in fulfilling our purpose as a church, then we must become more consistent at living out our call as a church. So in other words, we must become more consistent at loving God and loving others before we can even begin really filling our purpose. <clears throat> I want to back it up to chapter 1 in John because here's another conversation about abiding in Christ. The following day, John, and this is John the Baptist that he's speaking of here. The following day, John the Baptist was again standing with two of his disciples. So this is before Jesus' ministry has officially started. It's really just at the beginning of this. And these two disciples of John's who we believe, we know one is Andrew, the other one's very likely John, the guy who wrote the book of John. Um, so they're standing with, with John the Baptist, probably talking, who knows what they're doing. And all of a sudden, Jesus walks by. And John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. There's the guy you've been waiting for, right? There's the guy that I have been preparing all of these people for. I've been telling you he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. There he is. There's the Lamb of God. There's the Messiah. And when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. And I imagine this not like as a, why are you following me kind of thing? But there had to be a little bit of that kind of question, right? So as Jesus is walking by, they all of a sudden start to just follow him. Now, Jesus knows, right? Because he's God and he knows their hearts. He knows what's inside. He knows what they're doing. He, knows, he understands it. He gets it. But he wants to hear from them. What are you doing? What do you want? Why, why are you following me? And they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, which means that they knew a little bit at least of who Jesus is, that he is the teacher, the teacher. Where are you staying? And Jesus has a simple answer. Well, come and see. Come and see. Come and see where I'm staying. That sounds like a pretty casual conversation if you're just looking over it, topical, you know, just briefing over it. Where are you staying? I mean, that sounds like good small talk, doesn't it, when you're first meeting the Messiah for the first time? Hey, you new in town? <laughs> where are you staying? Oh, that's where you're staying? I know that place, right? Like you're just trying to make some conversation. What, what do you say to the Messiah? I mean, come on, right? This had to be a bit of a tough conversation. And maybe the guys just didn't know what to say, so that's what they came up with. But whether or not, if they realize it or not, we don't really get that insight. But this simple question, where are you staying, actually has a bit deeper meaning, a much deeper meaning. <clears throat> when they asked, where are you staying, the Greek translation of that question literally means, where do you abide? Where do you abide? Where do you remain? Where do you abide? Where do you connect is maybe a better way to even say it. And Jesus says, 
well, come and see. Right? Like Jesus doesn't just necessarily tell them. He says, come and see. Don't just come and see where I sleep and lay my head at night. Don't just come and see where I eat my, my meals. But come and see where I connect with God. Come and see where I remain with God, how I abide in God. And then come and make that place your place where you too remain in God. Really, this is an invitation for all of us. Jesus is inviting us to come and to see. This is an invitation not just to, uh, to uh, Andrew and to John or to any one of the 12 disciples. This is literally an invitation for all of us. Jesus, being God, is inviting us to, to come and abide with him. And I guess I had to ask myself several times that question. And the more I asked myself that question, the more I just had that thought. It just took me deeper and deeper and deeper. Because it's really like, why would he do that? Why, why would God want us to abide in him? And the only thing I kept coming up with was that he wants us. <laughs> like, have you really thought about that? Like, God literally wants us. Like you, me, he wants us. He wants us to be connected with him. He wants us to be close to him. But most importantly, since he already knows everything about us, he wants us just to connect with him in a way that we get it, that we start to understand who he is, that we start to see in maybe a different form that we haven't before. Now, I am convinced that most days I live beneath my spiritual potential. And I won't speak for anybody else, but I will speak for myself. And, and I know I do that. And I know that because I'm not always accepting this invitation to abide in Christ, to just get in with him, <laughs> to just talk with him, to just sit with him in silence, just pray with him, to just whatever, be connected to him. Some days are, are a lot worse than others. <laughs> I'm sure you can probably relate with me. I remember a former pastor of mine. In fact, he's the one who mentioned he's going to be here next week. Um, and you'll be blessed by him, I'm sure. But I remember him saying to me one time, um, I, we had the talk, and he was like, I'm trying to exercise. Let's go walk the track of the school. We were at Big Laville, um, Centenary in Big Laville. And we're walking the track, and he's talking. And he said, you know, I've been, been praying for a pianist, and I know we're going to get one. And I just remember being very skeptical about this because you know how hard it is to find a pianist, right? Everybody knows this is becoming a lost art in many, many ways. And I was like, eh, nah, yeah, probably not going to happen. God's probably got some other plans. We're going to have to come up with something else. And all this is running through my mind. But really what ended up happening is a short time after he told me this, guess what? We had a new pianist. We did. We had a new pianist. I'm like, where'd she come from? How did this happen, right? But he was like, I know it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. And I just remember thinking like, what, what's the matter with you? <laughs> like, okay, whatever, you know, and just letting it go. But it really happened. And the whole reason I knew that he knew that could happen was because he was connected with God. He had been praying, not just asking God like a vending machine. He was deeply connected with God, and he knew God's will for the church. And he already knew that God had that in the works because he was connected to God, because he was abiding in God. If we are willing to take seriously the invitation to abide in Jesus... We just might be surprised at all that God does and all that God is up to that we have no clue of. Isaiah um, has this whole, uh, well, the book of Isaiah is just absolutely wonderful. But in chapter 55, he has this whole section in there that really does an awesome job, I think, of helping us to understand how to actually abide in God. So I want to share this with you. If anyone, is anyone thirsty, come and drink, even if you have no money. Come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Now, spoiler alert, he's not talking about food. <laughs> he's not talking about milk. He's not talking about wine. He's not talking about food of any kind in that way, like we think physically eating or drinking. Got an idea what he's talking about? Keep reading with me. Come to me with your ears open wide. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. See how I used him to display my power among the peoples? I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations you do not know. And people unknown to you will come 
running to obey because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. So let's make sure we don't get ourselves built up too high. We're not the ones doing this. We're not the ones going to be like, oh, everybody's coming running to us. No, because God is doing great things in a new movement. People are going to hear this and people are going to come running all because of what God is doing. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to, the Lord, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That's a lot. There's a lot in this passage to unpack, and a lot of greatness in there that we can see of how to abide in God. But I first want to point out something to you here. Did you notice in the passage that through the prophet Isaiah, God is making a covenant? He's making a covenant like he made with David. It's a covenant for spiritual success. It's a covenant for living out God's purpose. It's living out God's call for us. So my third point here for you today is that God has made an everlasting covenant with us to live out our call and purpose. Purpose. David was one of the, I think he really is, one of the well-known or best-known people of the whole Bible. We know David right off the bat as a young boy who took a slingshot and a stone and took down this huge giant in one shot, right? We know David as becoming the, the king of Israel, who God blessed greatly. We also know David for not being perfect, right? He made a lot of mistakes, but yet God continued to use him, especially as David recognized all that and confessed. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, shortly after David had become king, we read that David that David has this desire to build a temple for God. And what ends up happening is that David is looking at his home that he lives in, this nice cedar home, and he looks at the tent where God presides. Now, it had been a tent because the people in the wilderness, goes back to that, were moving often in the wilderness, so it was a tent. It was portable, if you would. So this is where God is still presiding, and David says, uh-uh, we're past that moving time. We're here God needs something better than a tent. God needs something better, and I'm going to build it for him. And so he says to the prophet Nathan at the time, he says, you know what? I have this great idea. I want to build God a house. And Nathan says, that's great. I love that idea. Let's do it. Go for it, David, right? Sounds wonderful. They're all on board. But later that night, God has a little conversation with the prophet Nathan, and he says, Nathan you're wrong. <laughs> and he says, here's what's really going to happen. I need you to share this with David. And I'm just paraphrasing here, but he says, David, your heart's in the right place. Your heart is in the right place, but you are not the one who's going to build me a house to dwell within. Remember how I called you and the way in which I have been with you and the people of Israel? I'm going to continue to do that. I'm not going anywhere. But David, you shall not make a place for me but rather I will make a place for you and your people. I will protect you through one that will be one of your own descendants. That one will build a house for me. That one will build a throne of his king and be his, excuse me, will build a throne and a house for me and his kingdom will be forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Now David was really doing this with the right kind of heart, right? But he was making the same mistake that a lot of us make. We try to make a place for God to abide. We want him to bless what we are doing rather than allowing God to show us a place to abide, rather than allowing God to show us what he is really up to. We attempt to build a place for God to abide because we're really trying to live for our own agendas, for our own desires, our, our own wants. But God said to David, and he says this to us, don't invite me to abide with you. I want you to abide with me. So instead of us just trying to bring God in, put him in our box, put him in our space, however big we allow that to be or whatever we allow that to be, God says, I want you to come to me. 
Remember Jesus said, come and see. Come and see how to abide in God. And God is saying, I want you to abide with me. That's a powerful understanding, and that's a powerful thought. And I, I hope you really spend some time on that this week. The church will be relevant. The church will be powerful. The church will be able to fulfill the call and the purpose and all of the potential that we have if we respond to God's invitation to abide in him instead of wanting him always just to come in to us. Isaiah says a couple of things here that we have to do to abide in God. And first one of the things is he says, you've got a hunger. You've got a thirst for God. So he starts off by saying, are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Do you thirst for God? Right? He's not really talking about milk and wine and food. He wants to know if you're hungry for God. He wants to know if you are so thirsty for God that you would do anything to get that drink. Are you willing to give up anything to get that drink? Because let's just be honest, we quench that thirst with all sorts of other stuff. And all too often, we are quenching that thirst with so much other stuff that will never satisfy us. But we fill it up with so much other stuff that we have no room left for God. Pastor and author A.W. Tozer once said it like this, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things we can do by ourselves. If we're asking God to abide with us, then we're limiting what he can do. We're telling him just to come into our own ideas, our own desires, our, what we can imagine, God. But when God says, if you abide in me, watch out. That's where great things are going to happen. Secondly, Isaiah says that we must call upon God now, not later, not when it's just convenient for us. We've got to call on him now. It's not that God is planning to move, by the way. It's not that, planning, that God is planning to go anywhere other than be here with us. But the problem is, is that we end up sinning and then building these walls between us, or we end up just fading away from God. So God's saying, look, you're paying attention to me right now. Listen. Come now and call upon me now. Don't wait until you, you drift or you have some trial in life to just seek me then. It might be a lot harder to do then. Come seek me now while your eyes are already open. We've, we've got to get serious about abiding in Christ now while we're hearing, while we're listening. And this is what I've been saying about this new movement. God is doing something big. He is speaking to us. We're here, right? We're hearing this. We're celebrating it. We're honoring God for it. So let's listen and let's pay attention and let's call on God during all of this perfect time. If we are going to abide in Christ and be the church that God is calling us to be, then the posture that we need to have is on our knees. We need to be listening for his voice. And then from that posture, then we can go. Then we can do whatever God is giving us the power and ability to do. We abide in Christ when we first understand the importance of calling on God now. God says, come. In, in Isaiah, he says, you got to come. you got to seek. you got to listen and call on me. And this last piece, let me just bring this back again. He says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. All right, so <laughs> I think this just goes to show, don't try to put God in your own box because it isn't going to be anything like what he can do. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Abiding in Christ means that our ways are, excuse me, it means that our thoughts, our ways are not the truth that guides us, right? Abiding in Christ means that God's ways, God's truth, God's values, God's agenda, God's plans, those things are our desire. And when we surrender to them, then that's when we're abiding in Christ. And that's when and how we're going to actually live our call and our purpose. You know, when, when Jesus said to Peter, on you I will build my house, right? I will own you. I will build my church. You're going to be the rock that I build my church on. I believe God is saying that to us as well. On you is where I will build my church. And we will be a church that's effective, that multiplies when we're abiding in Christ. And we are coming to him and we're not just fitting him into our lives. Paul has this wonderful response um, 
And this was actually shared with us at the summit a few weeks ago. And I really, the scriptures just stuck with me. And I think it fits well with what we're talking about with the Lord's message here today. And so I just want to share this with you from Ephesians 3, uh, verses 14. Oh, did I not put it up there? My bad. That's okay. You're going to have to listen. So that's all right, too. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 says, When I think of all of this, this is Paul. He says, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That's abiding, isn't it? When your roots grow so far down into him and keep, him, they keep you strong. Continues, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And Paul ends it by saying, Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinity more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. The scriptures are written in your bulletin, and I encourage you to especially look up Ephesians and read that again and look at that again and again for yourself. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. He is the source of life. Apart from him, we're going to absolutely do nothing. It is by God's grace that we are invited to abide in him. It is by God's grace that we are invited to have this call and to fulfill this purpose. So again, our call is to love God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And our purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ.